to please. Hallelujah. Stand up on your feet. I want to give you a scripture. And my Lord, we're going to preach this thing for about an hour and a half. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo. Glory be to God. Y'all ready? Y'all ready for an hour and a half or two? Can't wait. Man, look at people. Watch that ball game for uh, three hours. Let me tell you something about the ball game, y'all. If you don't have a DVR on your TV, get one. Because what you can do, you can DVR it, you can tape it. I'm just telling you, if you ain't spending enough time with the Lord. But you can tape it and you can watch the ball game that would have been three hours and 30 minutes. Can I get amen up in here? But isn't it funny how we'll sit down and watch a ball game for three hours? And then we'll come into church and we wish the preacher would shut up. It's time to go. I'm hungry. Y'all, God has something for us today. How many want to receive something from the Lord? I want you to open up your Bibles. to, And we're going to be coming out of Exodus chapter 14, Revelation chapter 12. But right now I want to open you up to Psalms 33. Psalms 33 verse 18. Psalms 33 verse 18. When you get there, say amen. amen. Psalms 33 verse 18. When you get there, say amen. I got Kathy give me an amen. Oh, hallelujah. We're getting some amens up in here now. Praise God. Psalms 33, 18 says this. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them who fear him. Upon them who hope in his mercy. How many up here is hoping in his mercy today? How many has got your eyes on the Lord? Oh, Lord, we're going to learn how important that is in a minute. Father, I thank you right now for your awesome goodness, your mercy, your grace, your awesome power. Lord, fill this vessel with the spirit of the living God. Use me for your glory. Let your words go forth with power, victory, and authority, penetrating the hearts, minds, and souls of your people. Father, we're here to worship you, to glorify you. Even right now, Father, this is a most awesome time of worship. Let your word penetrate our hearts. Let it bring forth much fruit in our lives. For, Lord, we know that not just hearers, but doers of your word, that you will bless, that you will lead, that you will guide. Father, we give you all the praise, we give you all the glory, we give you all the honor. And everybody says, Amen. can we give God a big old clap of praise for you? See, come on, y'all, praise the Lord. He's worthy, church. Amen, amen, amen. You can be seated, praise the Lord. It's funny, sometimes I go into some churches and after the service, they'll say, boy, you sure do like the people stand up a lot, don't you? And I say, well, yeah, I like to stand in front of the Lord. I like to give God the praise. I can't help it, church. He's worthy, Amen. So anyway, I just praise God. Thank you all for being obedient and that's giving God the praise. Two Sundays ago, I was speaking about what happens when it's like you're at a dead end. You're at the Dead Sea or the Red Sea and you can't go anywhere. You can't go to the right or left. You've got the enemy behind you. And there was two things we pointed out, two things that you, you are to do or that it would be good to do when you're at a place where you can't see a way to get out. Number one, I talked about, this was two weeks ago. I'm not going to go into detail. I'm just going to give them to you. But number one, I said this, that God means for you to be where you are. Get that in your spirit. God means for you to be where you are. It's not by an accident. It just comes to having to really totally trust God. That was the first thing I said. The second thing I said was be concerned. Now, this is a good one here, y'all. We really got some detail on it. But be concerned for God's glory and for your relief. Amen. Y'all remember that? Be more concerned for God's glory. In other words, God gets all the glory when we're going through something that we don't really enjoy going through. Can I get amen up in here? Amen. And the third one that I want to talk to you about today is this. We're just going to be t talking about one. But the third one is this, and this is so important, church. This is the third key. Acknowledge your enemy. Everybody say, acknowledge your enemy, but keep your eyes on the Lord. Acknowledge your enemy, but your focus, church, has to stay on Jesus. Can I get amen up in here? This is the third key. This is so important. And we're going to hit some stuff. I want to make some comparisons. I'm going to be reading out of Exodus chapter 14, starting with verse 5 through 9. I just want to read this scripture to show you where we're at. This is, and y'all know this is where the children of Israel, Moses has led them. They're at, the dead, they're at the Red Sea. They feel like they're trapped. They've been led out of Egypt. The enemy let them go. How many of you are out of Egypt when you got saved and born again? How many realize you're out of Egypt? You're out of sin when God saved you and he birthed you into his kingdom. But can I tell you this? The devil don't stop just because you're out of his territory. Uh-oh, didn't get no amen on that. The enemy don't stop pursuing just because you're out of his kingdom and you've been placed in God's kingdom. 
Okay, so there's a battle up in here. There's a battle going on. Now let's look at the scripture. It says in, in verse 5, chapter 14 of Exodus, it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. The heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. They said, why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? You know what the enemy, the biggest mistake he ever made is when he let you go. Woo, somebody help me up in here. When he let you go and you began to serve God. That was a mistake, wasn't it? But he didn't have no choice because God is greater. God is all power. So they've been let go. They come out of Egypt. Now look at this. But now Pharaoh, a mere man, he's wondering in his heart, why did we do this? Why did we let these people go? They were making our bricks for us. They were making our straw. They were building these buildings for us. Now we ain't got nobody to do it. And he said right here in verse 6, that he made ready his chariot, took his people with him. He took 600 chosen chariots, all the chariots of Egypt, and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. He pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses, chariots of Pharaoh. His horsemen, his army, overtook them in camping by the sea. I want you to see this, y'all. It's as if they've come out of Egypt. It's as if they're fixing to step into the promised land. And all of a sudden, before they can get across, before they can get to the place that God wants them to be, boom. You have an enemy who raises his head, who tries to stop God's people. Now, listen, I want us to do something right here. I remember I said, acknowledge your enemy, but keep your eyes on the Lord. Let's consider some parallels right here, y'all, between a two-legged man called Pharaoh and that spiritual being that God created a long time ago. His name is Lucifer. We know him as Satan and the devil. I want to make some parallels. I want you to see because you can always tell when the devil's using a person. Can I get another amen up in here? Let's consider some parallels. Both Pharaoh and Satan are enemies to God's people. How many realize we have an enemy? Do y'all know we have an enemy? You, you, you have an enemy now because you're saved and born again. and you're Come on, because you belong to God. So he, the, Satan is your enemy. He's my enemy. He's all of God's people's enemy. So number one, both Pharaoh... Satan are enemies to God's people. Both covet the power of God for themselves. Pharaoh wants to be all power, two-legged man. Well, that's what uh, Satan wanted. He wanted to exalt his throne above God's throne, but it didn't happen. Both, number three, both are enraged beyond measure. Pharaoh is so mad now, he can't hardly see straight. Why did we let him go? We're going to go after them, and we're going to destroy them. So Pharaoh's mad just like Satan is mad because he got cast out of heaven. Going to get amen up in here. Both have assembled vast armies for the destruction of God's people. Pharaoh got an army together to do what, y'all? To destroy God's people. What do you think Satan's doing today? He's got his little army. He got it together trying to seek and devour and destroy God's people. Can I get amen up here? You got an enemy. I want you to understand that, okay? See, some of y'all getting worried now. You know why? You focus it on the devil. I said, acknowledge him. Know that you got one, but keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. Oh, Lord, there's such a big spiritual truth. If you can get that in your spirit, maybe you'll get it a little bit. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Now, here's the good part, y'all. Number five, both Pharaoh and even Satan, both don't seem to realize they have been utterly defeated by God himself. Can I get an amen up in here? Pharaoh don't realize it. Satan don't seem to realize that he has been utterly defeated. How many know he's a defeated foe? Yes, Jesus said, he said, I've seen Satan cast as lightning down to the earth from heaven. He's been cast out of heaven, y'all. He don't even have his estate in heaven anymore. He got kicked out and he's mad. How many knows he's mad? He knows he has but a short time. Can I get another amen up in here? Now, the enemy he is, he's like a serpent who deceives. You can find that in Genesis chapter 3. He's like a vulture trying to steal the seed of God's word from the hearts of men. That's in Matthew chapter 13. He's like a wolf who attacks the flock of God. Can I get amen up in here? That's in John chapter 10. He comes as a raving wolf. He'll dress up like a sheep, but he's a wolf. He's like a lion trying to devour God's children. That's found in 1 Peter chapter 5. And in Revelation chapter 12. Everybody say Revelation chapter 12. I love the book of Revelation. That's what we're going to go in a minute. Y'all go ahead and open your Bible to Revelation chapter 12. But in Revelation chapter 12, y'all, he's like a dragon waiting to destroy 
God's only begotten son. Now I want you to think about this. A lot of people don't like the book of Revelation. I love it. When you go to Revelation chapter 12, we've got to go there for a little bit. I want you to see that there's a great wonder going on. There's a great wonder in heaven. John sees all this from the Isle of Patmos. He sees, really, he sees in his, in his vision, he's seeing a woman. That woman represents Israel. You can go back in Genesis. I can show you all that. But anyway, this woman represents Israel. This woman is fixing to give birth to a seed. That seed being the Messiah. That seed being Jesus. Okay? Now, because we know that Jesus was a Jew. Come on, somebody help me up in here. In his physical body, he was a Jew. But he was much more than a Jew, y'all. That's just a nationality. That don't really mean a whole lot. He was the son of God, the only begotten son of God. He's the lamb of God. Amen. Can I get amen up in here? But this woman, Israel, God used the people. He chose a nation to bring forth his Messiah. He had to choose somebody. He could have chosen some Scotch-Irish. It would have been nice. I'd have been in the lineage of Jesus in the, in, the, in the physical. But he didn't do that. Can I get amen? He chose the Jewish people. He chose you, and, and he's going to bring forth the Messiah. Now, the Bible says when Israel was, was pregnant, ready to give birth to that seed. That, and look at it. It's in Revelation 12. I'm going to be paraphrasing some, but you can read it yourself. That there was a dragon there waiting for the birth of that baby. Waiting for that word to come forth because the dragon wanted to do one thing. And that was to devour Jesus to devour the word of God. Let me tell you something about that because there's a spiritual truth in there. See, that's what the devil does today. He wants to devour the word of God for it can ever get into your heart. Somebody help me up in here because if there's a battle he's lost, when the word of God ever gets into a person's heart, he's lost that battle because when the word comes in, the spirit of God makes it alive. All of a sudden, you're born again. You're born into God's, uh, into God's kingdom. So here comes the woman, Israel, giving birth to the man-child, Jesus, and you got Satan waiting to devour it. But the Bible says, he, how many knows he couldn't devour that seed? He couldn't devour Jesus, even though he wanted to. And you look at the scripture, y'all, they killed a lot of babies back then. The enemy did a lot of things trying to stop that. But the Bible says, if you look in chapter 12, that this man child was caught up. Let's just, let me give it to you right here. Well, I'm getting ahead a little bit. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought. Let me just show you this. They fought. There's a battle in heaven. I got a paraphrase. I can't read that. Let me just tell it like this. The enemy's trying to stop that seed. He can't stop it. The Bible says that that seed, Jesus, was caught up. And he's by the right hand of God right now, interceding for us. Amen. The child was caught up. He paid the price. He laid his life down. He shed his blood. He went through everything he was supposed to go through. Got to get another amen. So he's by the right hand of the Father right now. And the Bible says, I think it goes back to even before Genesis, before man was even created. He goes back and talks about Michael and his archangels. And there was a fight against Lucifer and his angels. The Bible says that Lucifer took a third of the angels with him when he got cast out of heaven. I believe he was a high-ranking angel, probably the most highest-ranking angel. And he lost his estate, y'all. He lost his position with God. Because he wanted to exalt his position above God. You ever seen anybody who just wants to be the head on everything? Can't be submissive to nobody. Got to be their way or no way. Somebody help me up in here. God ain't into that. That's what Satan does. Satan gets into titles. Men, are, men and women of God shouldn't get into titles. We get into Jesus. Come on, somebody help me. Because he's God and there's none like him. But here he is. Here's the end of it. There's a fight. And the Bible says that Lucifer and a third of the angels were cast out of heaven. Cast out. And now I know we can get to a lot of theological things right here. And we can say, well, this is, you know, a lot about the tribulation period. Seven years of tribulation. The last three and a half years is going to happen on this earth. I'm not going to the tribulation right now. I'm not even teaching that. I want you to see that Satan has lost his estate. He's lost his authority. Now, he has authority that... The authority he has now, he can only do what God lets him do. Well, I'm going to get amen up here now. God allows Satan to do things so God can get the glory for everything. Amen. We don't like what he does. I don't like what he does. Nonetheless, I got to deal with him. You do too, amen? But I understand this in my spirit, that there's not one thing the devil can do to me that God don't allow I understand that. I know that. Period. Nobody can tell me any different. And people say, well, what about this? What about that? What about that? I'm just here to tell you, God is all power, church. The devil is on a chain. And when it comes to God's people, he is limited at what he can do. 
If God allows something to go on in my life, in your life, whoever, whatever it may be, God has a purpose and a reason way beyond us. Can I get amen? amen? That's why we can trust God in every aspect, every part of our life. Yes, we don't like sickness. We don't like things that affect our body. Nobody likes that. But you know what? Sometimes God allows those things to happen so he can get the glory in yes. everything. Come on, y'all. It's hard to praise God when you're going through a hard place. It's hard to praise God when you get a report from a doctor don't sound good. Come on, y'all. It's not easy. But I promise you, if you learn to praise God wherever you're at right now, God will begin to get all the glory. He'll get all the praise for everything. Because, listen, sickness can't stop the plan of God. Sickness can't stop the purpose of God. Sickness can't stop nothing that God is going to do. Come on, somebody help me up in here. The devil cannot stop one thing that God is going to do in your life. He can't do it. You've got to say, here I am, Lord, use me. Bring me through this thing. Now, all of this stuff, I'm telling you, what happens, see what happens when the enemy attacks us, when he's moving. The first thing we begin to do is we lose our focus. We begin to focus on what he's doing. We begin to, we begin to focus on the, on, because the enemy it seems like he's done something, we begin to focus on what he's done to us. And I'm here to tell you, don't focus on the enemy. Don't focus on what's going on. Focus on Jesus. Focus on the one who has overcome death, hell, and the grave. Focus on Jesus who's paid the price, who shed his blood, who said, here. Uh, come on, y'all. Everybody in here. Every one of us in here right now. Every one of us are healed. How many realizes that? We are healed in the name of Jesus by the power of the God through his blood. We're healed because what? Now listen. We all going to die. There's no doubt about that. Things affect our body. But I'm here to tell you we're healed by the blood of Jesus. I'm not talking about just seeing your physical healing here. When you get to heaven, God says he's going to give you a glorified body. A body that'll never see sickness, that'll never die. Come on, somebody help me. One day this body's going to die, y'all. I don't know how. But it don't really matter what takes my body, what affects this body. I've been bought with a price. I'm cleansed by the blood. Hallelujah. I got a glorified body coming one day that'll never get sick. Can I get amen up in here? So whatever the enemy's doing, it don't matter. People think, oh, I'm so anointed. I got this double portion of the anointing. I'm not going to get sick. Really? Why don't you tell Elisha that? Elisha had a double portion of an anointing, y'all. And the Bible says he died with a disease in his body. Maybe Elisha didn't have no faith. Maybe Elisha didn't trust God. Do you really believe that? He was a mighty man of faith. He was a, so, so what I'm trying to show you is this. The enemy couldn't do nothing to Elisha but what God allowed. Same thing with Paul. Paul had a thorn in the flesh, y'all. He had a spirit to buffet him in his flesh. I believe he couldn't see good. I believe he was half blind because when he got knocked off his high horse for killing Christians. Somebody help me up in here. Y'all say amen, son. You can water. Paul got knocked off his high horse because he was killing Christians, throwing them in jail. Everybody asked me, why do you think Paul spent so much time in jail? Because he threw a bunch of Christians in jail. Amen? Come on. Whatever man sows, he's going to reap. I don't care if God did knock him off high horse. Praise God for that. And he got saved, got born again. But when he come against God's people, didn't matter if he was saved, born again or not, he spent time in jail, didn't he? He spent time in prison. But guess what? God used it for his glory. Can I get amen up here? He used it for his glory. God used Paul where he was at for his glory. Brought him through that and made him a mighty man. A mighty, 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 mighty man. Can I get another amen up in here? So let's go back to chapter 12 for just a little bit. He says the great dragon, he was cast out in verse 9. That, that old serpent called the devil and Satan who, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. A lot of people today don't believe we have an enemy. They don't believe there's a spiritual battle going on. And that spiritual battle is a battle over the seed of God's word getting into the heart of man. That's always been the battle. That's the battle today, y'all. Stopping that seed and then stopping that seed from producing what God wants it to produce. Now look at this. All of a sudden, John hears this. He says, and I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now it's come salvation, strength, the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accursed them before our God day and night. Let me tell you, you've got an accuser who accuses you every day to God. 
He, he can't go up to heaven. He can't live in the third heaven no more. He's been cast out. But he goes up from this first heaven to the second heaven. The heavenly is over us. Third heaven is the kingdom of God. He goes up and he accuses brethren. When we mess up, guess what? The first thing he does, he gets one of his little imps or him or himself. And he goes and begins to accuse us before the Father. Now, sometimes his accusations are false. Sometimes they're not. So I'm so glad I got an advocate. Somebody hit me up and I'm so glad that I got Jesus the, who goes in between me and Satan. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I thank God that I got Jesus. When I mess up, he says he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins if we'll just confess. Amen. So he can do all the accusations he wants. And some of them may be true. But praise God, I got Jesus who says that is mine. He belongs to me. I bought him with a price. Look, he's repenting, Father. You hear him? He's repenting. Lord, Father, do you hear him? He's repenting. Let's get him back out of that mess. Let's restore him to where he needs to be. Somebody help me up in here. You got an advocate. You got Jesus the go in between for you. Ain't that awesome to know? And he's faithful, y'all. He is faithful. Now, look at this. He says right here, and they overcome. Verse 11, you know how to be an overcomer? They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. They loved not their lives unto the death. You overcome the devil. You overcome the enemy because of the blood of Jesus and because now you got a testimony. My testimony is this, y'all. I once was in sin, but now I got life. Come on, y'all. I once was on my way to hell, but now I'm on my way to heaven. My testimony is there's somebody took my place on the cross. Somebody took my place. Somebody shed his blood for me. That somebody is Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus, the Lamb of God. My testimony is, Lord, you shed your blood. Your blood cleanses and covers me. Hallelujah. I can't see it, Lord, but I know it's there. I can't see the Spirit of God, but I know he's in here. He bears witness with my spirit that I belong to God. Come on, church. you got a witness. I don't drink no more. I don't do drugs anymore. I don't do all that garbage and all that mess I used to do. No, because now I'm a new creature. I've been cleansed by the blood and I have a testimony. And now you're an overcomer. Doesn't matter what the enemy does. Doesn't matter what he tries to do. We're more than overcomers through the blood of Jesus and the word of our testimony. But look at this right here. It says in verse 12, Therefore rejoice, you who are in heaven and you who dwell in them. When a person goes to heaven, y'all, when a person dies and they're saved and born again, they go to heaven. There's rejoicing in, even in heaven right now, y'all. We're down here on this earth. But I promise you, right now in heaven, there's rejoicing going on. Even the angels are rejoicing. I believe, I don't know how often a born-again believer dies in their body and they go to heaven. I don't know. But I promise you this. Every time a born-again believer goes to heaven, boom, rejoicing starts. So I believe there's rejoicing continuously going on in heaven. I just believe that. Because when a baby dies, there's not known this wickedness that we see. Come on. Immediately they're in heaven. So heaven is continuously full of rejoicing. But look at this, y'all. Look at this. He says, rejoice ye in heavens, you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you having what? Great wrath. Because he knows he has but a short time. Now, I know if we study this thing out and you, get, and you look at it, we know we're talking about the last three and a half years of tribulation period when the devil's wrath's going to be poured out. It's like God's going to just take his hand off. You know what I'm saying? Lift his hand. I like to tell it like this. God gave Jesus three and a half years of ministry on this earth. How many realize that? The Son of God, when he started his ministry, he had three and a half years of ministry on this earth to minister to people, to tell people, to show people who he really is. He's the Messiah. Without a question, without a doubt, Jesus is the Messiah. With that same amount of time that God allotted for Jesus, he's allotting for Satan in the man called the Antichrist. He'll have three and a half years to deceive people. Somebody help me up in here. The Bible even talks about that. You wouldn't believe the truth. Now, guess what? People will believe a lie. They'll believe the great lie. For the last three and a half years, God's wrath ain't even poured out during that time. People get so confused with the Word of God. Somebody help me. They think God's going to pour out His wrath for seven years on this earth, which is much of a bull. It's not. It don't take God seven, and a half, seven years, y'all, to pour out His wrath. In one hour, God will pour out His wrath. I promise you. That's what the Word of God says. The devil's going to pour out his wrath the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. A lot of people are going to be martyred. A lot of people are going to be killed. Those that have a testimony of Jesus, those who believe in God, those that are obedient to God's commandments and believe in Jesus, some of them are going to be slaughtered and going to be wiped out. 
that will be martyred for Christ. That's, I mean, that's what the Bible says if you look at verse number 17, the last part of it. It says, And the dragon was wroth with the woman, went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you this, y'all? We're in a battle because we keep God's word and we have the testimony of Jesus. The enemy wants to destroy it. But how can you destroy something that belongs to God? Somebody help me. Even when your body's laid down, what is that, y'all? This is just the body. This ain't even the real you. We look at each other. I look at Gail and I said, oh, that's Gail. I know Gail. I know Roy. By these physical lines. But really, that's not the real Roy and the real Gail. Gail, that's just bodies. All of us are spirit beings in a body that God has given us. Can I get amen up in here? And one day, your spirit and soul is going to leave that body. So what I'm trying to tell you, the only thing man can do and the devil do, it, well, not even the devil. He don't have keys to power, death, and hell no more. But the only thing that's going to be laid down and destroyed is this body. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This body is going to be laid down. But the real you is going to live forever. Your spirit and soul is going to live forever. That's why Paul said, I pray your whole body, soul, and spirit be reunited at the coming of the Lord. There's people right now, y'all, that are in heaven in spiritual bodies that are waiting on their body to be resurrected. How many know that? That's the word of God. And Paul talks about that. When we leave our body, we will be in a spiritual body. It's not like we're going to be floating around somewhere. It's not like the Roman, Roman Catholic chief that there's a place called purgatory. Nobody's going to purgatory. Can I get amen up in here? Nobody's been going to purgatory to be prayed out. And then if you give so much money to the church and we'll pray for you, you can be delivered from purgatory and go to heaven. It's not even in the Bible. Yet there's rituals and people who believe that, believe it to this day. Millions, millions and millions of people right now, y'all, believe what the Pope says when they say, you know, in the priest that you can give us money, we'll pray for your loved ones that have died because you're not sure if they went to heaven or not, and we'll pray them out of purgatory. That is the deception from the devil because that can't happen. Nobody's going to purgatory, y'all. When we leave this body, people are either going to hell or they're going to heaven. The place called Hades, it's called Hades. Hell is, and it is a holding place until there, every soul that's in hell one day in Hades is going to be caught out of there to stand before God. Can I get amen up in here? But that's the only holding place, but there ain't nobody going to heaven out of that, amen? It's just waiting for that lake of fire. Boy, that's a hard message, ain't it? Somebody help me up in here. That's the truth. We got such a water gown gospel today. People don't want to hear about hell. People don't want to hear, hear about nothing of that. But let me tell you, hell is real just like heaven is. We don't have to go to hell. We can go to heaven by being born again. But you must be born again. You must ask Jesus to come to your heart. You must be cleansed by the blood. You've got to be filled with the Spirit of God. Somebody help me up in here. You have to be born again. That's important. We can't preach that enough. Now, we're getting back on this. I just want you to see we're in a battle. The enemy is doing a lot of things. So let me tell you this. Do not focus on the devil. How can we not do that? By focusing on Jesus. Focusing on what he has done. The price that he's paid. We are blessed, church. Anybody who knows the Lord is blessed. I mean, realize we're blessed beyond measure. You can't even put anything on it. Now, back to the enemy. It's, Think about this, what Jesus has done. He cursed the serpent. He placed his seed in the good ground of men's heart. He became the great shepherd who takes care of his flock. Jesus always takes care of his people. He always will. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he's also right now, I promise you, Jesus is by the right hand of the Father interceding for every one of us. Every one of his children, Jesus is interceding for. Can I get amen? Y'all being quiet in here. Is this too hard? Acknowledge, church that you have an enemy but keep your eyes focused on Jesus we got one who seeks to discourage you he wants to defeat you and I promise you he will pursue you but does that matter it shouldn't y'all think the enemy pursued Jesus the Bible says the spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness and when the Spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness, he met somebody in there. Guess who it was? He met the devil. And he defeated the devil by what? By the word of his testimony. Who is the word? How do you defeat the devil? By your word. It don't matter. It don't matter, devil. Jesus is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. 
Don't mind the devil, you can't do nothing but what God allows you to do. That really makes him mad too, by the way. <laughs> See, he's mad at me right now because I'm exposing some stuff, but he can't stand it. But he can only do anything, y'all, but what God allows. I don't focus on him. I focus on Jesus. I focus on that long rope that the Lord has sometimes because it seems like he gets out there a long ways. Amen. But this God is just pulling back in. God is God, y'all. He's all power. There's none like him. Don't be intimidated by the enemy. Did y'all hear that? Don't be intimidated, intimidated by the enemy, y'all. Resist him in the power of God and by the blood of the Lamb. James 4, 7, and 8 says this. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Jesus said in Luke 10, 18 through 20, this is what Jesus said. He said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now, this is what he said. And then after Jesus said that, here's what he said, y'all. He said, behold, I give unto you what? Power. Or I give unto you authority to tread on serpents, scorpions, over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Did y'all hear that? Did we believe that? He said, nothing shall by any means hurt you. We have authority over the enemy. We have authority because God has given it to us through Jesus. Whatever the enemy is doing, we have authority over that. Can I get amen up in here? We might get some bruised heels. Come on, y'all. We might get some bites on our heels, just like the, it says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The enemy of bru- that seed will bruise the Lord's heel. That seed, the heel will be, will be bruised. But I promise you, the, he- the heel of Jesus will crush his head, and his head has already been crushed. So we have authority in Jesus because he's given us that authority over the enemy. But then he says this in verse 20. Don't rejoice that the spirits are subject to you. Don't rejoice because the enemy has no control or power over you. Rejoice because your names are what? Written in heaven. Good Lord, somebody, we ought to rejoice right now. You ought to rejoice because your name is written in heaven. You ought to rejoice because your name is in the Lamb's book of life. Don't rejoice because we have victory over the enemy. Don't rejoice because we've overcome the enemy. Rejoice because your name is written in heaven. Hallelujah. Good Lord, can you imagine when you got saved and born again, your name's written in heaven. In a book. It's written in the Lamb's book of life. Your name is in his book. Isn't that awesome? That's why we ought to rejoice because God has chosen to put your name in his book. He's chosen to write Kathy's name in heaven. Good Lord, isn't that awesome, church, to know that your name is written in heaven. That's why we ought to be rejoicing. That's why we ought to be so happy. But keep, but remember, acknowledge, y'all. Acknowledge your enemy. And keep your eyes on the Lord. Don't blame God. See, a lot of times we blame God on directly doing something to us. God don't directly make you sick. Come on. God don't directly send people to hell. Come on. God don't directly do these things that everybody's blaming, on God, blaming God to do. The devil does these things. God does allow them because he's all power. Can I get amen up in here? He has a purpose beyond us. But the devil is the one who brings destruction. Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. And that's what he does. We have life after this little bit of life. Y'all come on, somebody help me. This little bit of life here is nothing compared to the one that's to come. When we leave this body, you're talking about living. We don't know what living is. Good Lord, we have no clue what living is. We get a little bit of taste. You know, sometimes when God puts you in a special place and he begins to pour out his presence on you and you begin to feel the presence of the Lord, you feel like you've done been raptured up somewhere. Somebody help me up in here. That's just a taste of what is coming. That's just a taste of what God is going to, what God is doing. You're talking about living. Wait till you get to heaven, my Lord. When you get to heaven, you're going to know what living really is. You ain't going to be bound by no fleshly body no more. You're going to be free. Good Lord, you're talking about being free. Good gracious, we ain't got a clue, y'all. What God has in store for those who love him. We have no clue about heaven. Paul had a clue. God showed him those things. See, it's like all through our life, we're trying to stay away from going to heaven. Because we begin to fear death. We begin to fear this or fear that. My Lord, y'all, that's where living really starts. Wouldn't it be nice if Jesus come down here right now? And everybody who was ready said, come on, y'all. It's time for us to go to heaven. Wouldn't it be something if Jesus come right now, y'all, and just took you by the hand and said, come on. Maybe like he did Enoch. And maybe like he just reached out and said, come on, Enoch. 
you're closer to me. You need to be up here where I'm at. There's too much stuff in between me and you right now. I got to get you right here in my bosom. Hallelujah. I want to get you up here where you can really see something. Just think if Jesus come through those doors right now and grabbed you by the hand and said, come on. Because I think that's what happens in death, y'all. Whether he loses, uses an angel or whatever, whether he uses Michael, the great archangel, who's the prince over, over the Jew, Jewish people, whoever he uses, if he wants to use an angel, or, or him himself when Stephen was being stoned. When they had stones around, they were throwing them stones at Stephen. And they was popping Stephen upside that head. Blood was gushing out of his head, out of his body. They were stoning that man. They were stoning him to be dead. And it's like he just looked up during the midst of this stoning. I see Jesus standing by the right hand of the Father. He's seen Jesus standing up, y'all. And because he's seen Jesus, I believe every stone that was hitting him, I believe God must have kept it from hurting him. Because he began to cry, Lord, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. Boy, I was a man of God, wasn't it? But can you imagine what Stephen is seeing right now? Can you imagine what Paul was doing right now? Moses, Abel, the very first one who was, who was martyred, whose blood, his blood was spilled by his brother. His righteous blood was crying out to God. Can you imagine what old Abel's doing right now? Oh, my Lord. Can y'all imagine? See, we have such a great cloud of witnesses that's already passed from this place that we're at. They're already in heaven. They're already, see, all of heaven is rejoicing. And when we begin to rejoice here, we feel a little glimpse. We feel a little bit of the awesome, mighty glory of God. But one day, one day, if we'll keep our eyes on Jesus, these little things we go through, won't be so hard. It won't be as bad as we really think they are. I mean, they're, they're, I don't want to take away from anything, but I'm trying to keep your eyes on Jesus, church. We have to. As a pastor, I promise you, I have to keep my eyes on the Lord continuously. It's a mistake when we acknowledge Jesus and keep our eyes on the devil. Let me say that one more time. It's a mistake when we just acknowledge Jesus and keep our eyes on the devil. It's far better to acknowledge our enemy, but keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Let me give you this. We're fixing to close. In all of Paul's letters, every single one of them that he wrote in the New Testament, the name Jesus occurs in 219 verses. The name Lord occurs in 272 verses. The name Christ occurs 300 in 389 verses. But on the other hand, in all of Paul's letters, y'all, only the name of Satan only occurs in 10 verses. And the name devil in 6 verses. So what do you think? We, who, who should we be focused on, y'all? In comparison... We have the name of Christ. We have the name of Jesus. We have the name of the Lord. Compared to this very few about this little enemy we got. So if you feel like you're trapped between Pharaoh's sword and, and the Red Sea, just acknowledge the enemy. Acknowledge him. But keep your eyes on Jesus because he always, always has his eyes on you. It's back to Psalms 33, 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them who fear him, upon them who hope in his mercy. So just acknowledge that, old enemy, but focus on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He always has his eyes on you. Can I get an amen up in here? Can we give God a big old clap? Come on, stand on your feet, y'all. Come on. Stand on your feet. Give God some praise. That's key number three, y'all. When you're in a place you don't know what to do, you say, Lord, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes. He's fixing to do something great. Amen. He's fixing to perform a miracle. Every head bowed, every eye closed.